Hi everybody, today let's talk about the courant from the fifth suite. The fifth suite is actually my favorite suite if I had to choose one. Luckily, I don't have to. This was the last suite I ever worked on, so I came to it as an adult. And maybe that's why I like it so much. It's still fresh for me. This courant is a very complex courant compared to the other courants in the suites. As I like to quote Alan Winold, he writes that differences in rhythmic style often lead to differences in character. The Italian style of the courant is more robust and straightforward, and the French style is more elegant and complex. And this fifth suite courant is a typical French type. All of the other courants in the cello suites are written in the Italian style. So one of the things that make this courant complex is the elided cadences. Elided cadences are cadences where the end of the cadence is not there because it overlaps with the beginning of the new phrase. Let me show you an example. So here in bar five, there is a clear example of an alighted cadence. Bach could have written something like this. And then. But he overlapped the, the next phrase with this cadence, so this C minor chord. Acts both as the end of the cadence and the beginning of a new phrase. And this movement has a lot of examples like this and other aspects to this movement that makes it more complex than simple is Bach moving from minor to major. So an example of major is in bars five and six. So we start with C minor. <laughs> This first half ends on a, a G octave. If you look at the lute version, this is a major key. Bach uses agogic accents. Those are accents that are caused by a longer note length, melodic figuration, so the phrase goes up, accenting a particular beat and harmonic rhythms. And so those three elements come to suggest that the beat is not always three halves for the bar. Here we can think of this as a moved bar line and starting in bar 10, we feel there's sort of a down beat on that trill on the F sharp. And again. If we look at bars 10 and 11, we can divide these bars instead of three half notes each to two half notes three times. So it's a hemiola. It's one, two, one, two, one, two. In the last bar of this half, we have a typical Baroque ending, which is basically taking this bar of three halves and dividing it into two smaller bars of three quarters each. The feeling is of one, two, three, one, two, three. And in tempo. Similarly, the very last bar of this dance is divided into two shorter bars of three quarters each. One, two, three.
is important to show that step motion and that lower voice here in red. <laughs> implied B flat, which is, I believe, in the lute a version. And then here we have an E flat in bar eight, D, and then again that lower voice in red. So practice separating the voices and then combining them being careful to bring out the lower voice, which sometimes is swallowed, is not uh, uh, marked clearly. You might have to either accent it a little bit, play it closer to the bridge to bring it out. Let's talk about slurs. I like avoiding playing always the down bow on a down beat to avoid monotony, obviously for for the heavier, more important beats, the pillars of support, we try to play those on the down bow, but if we always play down bow per the downbeat, it can be monotonous, and especially when there's repeated materials. So, here, I like to play it as it comes, and that's my interpretation of the Anna Magdalena slurs. You might have your own, but... Uh, up bow here. And again, up bow here. And that creates, in my opinion, a better build-up towards the downbeat of measure 10. to the hemiola in bar 10. Another reason to play that hemiola is that repeated gesture, which is dotted quarter tone coming back again on the third beat of measure 10. So we have dotted quarter, dotted quarter. So it's a question and answer, answer, conclusion. Statement, restatement, conclusion. So, statement, restatement, in a different color, and conclusion. Notice also that this last bar acts as a little tail. So, Bach could have finished on the downbeat of measure 11, but he added the tail, so it could have been... And in, at the very end of this movement, he could have also finished a bar earlier if he wanted to. But he added the little tail, so now it's... Uh, let's look at the lute version, which is the only surviving manuscript in Bach's hand. For the suites, uh, he wrote the lute version after he wrote the cello version. The lute was apparently his favorite instrument, and it really shows. It's such a beautiful, beautiful work. And in the lute, we hear fuller harmonies. It can give us a clue to the colors he wanted for the cello as well. Uh, so I encourage you to listen to lutists play this piece and get ideas. I wrote in some notes that I transcribed from the lute version, which is in G minor. And here they are, we're looking at bar three. This is from the lute version. Uh, if we were to add them. This is how it will sound. I'm not suggesting you do that, but it is interesting to work like that. Keep it in your inner ear. that this comes is bar seven, start in bar six. 
Again, I don't suggest you play it, just think about it. In measure 10, we have this in our part. In the lute, we have an accompaniment. work on this current, I try to bring out the gestures by sitting a little bit on beginning of slurs. When you break that chord, try to roll it, not to break it. In the second half, you can also experiment with playing the lute part just when you practice. Here. These are the G, E flat, uh, C, and A flat. Hey. As you can probably feel instinctively, the phrase ends after the first four eighth notes of bar 16. So, uh, and here we have a new beginning. I start on the upper uh, auxiliary and on the beat and I stop the the trill on the dot so on the after the quarter is done the that extra eighth is plain with no trill same here so we start from the upper note and we stop the trill on the dot. So after playing only one quarter. Here I want you to think of the Baroque bow. It is lighter at the tip, which translates to less even playing. So it's when we play back and forth 16th notes, the up bow will be lighter naturally which is very helpful in this piece because the, the notes you want to bring out happen to fall on the down bow. So, so don't try to play them all equal. That's not it. Also, when you play double stops, it's nice to sometimes not play them at the same time, especially if you want to bring the bottom note out and play the hair before the top. That's not to say that you should do it in, on every single double stop, but definitely sometimes, especially on the longer notes, in the beginning, this can be uh, rolled. And to be repetitive, but here roll, so sometimes you want to play them together and sometimes not, in order not to create a monotony. This is it for today, thank you very much for watching and we'll see you next time, bye.